Hello, Shiraz, can you hear me? I can hear you, Hasbi. Achha, mera khale abhi recording band kar dena zara. Jab shuru ho to sab karna na. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is not my first time uh, presenting in your. Appreciate we are doing it via Zoom. Not only that, but, but I'm talking to you actually from Africa. I'm just now in our Granada University campus in Malaysia, uh, from where uh, I'll deliver this webinar. Okay. May I just check that you can all hear me okay? If uh, Is there anybody who's having any difficulty with hearing? Me across. It's okay. It's okay. It's perfect. It's All perfect. Right. So I continue. I share the screen. Uh, as we progress, I also want to thank you, Dr. Shiraz, who you see on the on the list of participants. He has kindly helped to organize uh, the technical aspects of this meeting. The way we will run this is that we will have a 35, 40 minute session. Then we will have a 10 minute break in which you will do a little bit of piece of work, which we will discuss as we return to the next session. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about systematic reviews. And in this first part today, uh, we will cover in general what systematic reviews are. And uh, in the coming two days, in parts two and three, we will cover the details of specific aspects of reviews. For example, on the second day, we can cover specific issues related to systematic reviews of randomized trials. And on the third day, uh, systematic reviews of test accuracy studies. So you see my introduction here, including uh, images of a systematic review book that I have published. It's being produced in its third edition as I speak, and it has already been translated from English into German and Chinese. And here from the book, an article emerging, which shows the five different steps of systematic reviews. Framing questions, searching the literature, extracting data from the literature, uh, synthesizing the data and generating from it any recommendations, uh, which the process that is called grading. The way we will run the session is to make a presentation, open things up for answer and question, and uh, alongside how our systematic on how to write it up for publication. Now, the tips I give you about writing up are the same that you will need to use for writing up your own thesis and possibly also using the same for preparing for your uh, uh, oral or viva examination. Now, that for in terms of publication, this is the typical cycle that authors go through. They prepare a manuscript, submit it. It is peer reviewed, they revise it. Uh, it may be accepted, but usually it is rejected or and you need to make a resubmission. And this cycle continues until eventually your paper is accepted. So the idea behind these three days of webinars is that uh, you can pick up um, points that you can avoid or instill inside your manuscript 
so that uh, you can avoid the process of having to go through rejection and resubmission and be accepted on the first submission. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in Pakistan where I started In 1988, I completed my studies and after graduation, I moved to Kenya in Africa to start my training as a medical doctor. I then returned to come to complete. Training where I come. Completed my epidemiology training in Canada, following which I moved to the UK. After uh, there, um, last year, I took the opportunity to move to Granada. And during my last years uh, here in Granada and uh, in the UK, I got to know your country and your supervisor. And it's been a pleasure to deliver training courses uh, over the last years. Had the opportunity to have my first paper accepted for publication in 1990. Uh, so uh, my, my first systematic review was published in 1996, soon after my move to the UK. And uh, well, since then I have had the chance to, 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 if you don't mind, I'm going to just cut off my video for a moment in, in order to ensure that our connection does not become unstable or disconnected. I, so I had the chance in the publication of my first systematic review to edit various journals, including evidence-based medicine. And uh, I have published over 150 systematic reviews, in total over 400 papers, which have been cited uh, on several occasions. I've had the chance to present seminars like this in over 37 countries. Uh, this year and last year, I was included in the top 2% influential scientist in the Stanford list that has come. But I want to state that the most important thing for me is not actually the number of publications. Here you see the 150 publications. data, I had the privilege to assess in writing my work. And you can see the number is very large. And without the volunteerism, consent, and uh, sharing of the data by patients and participants, it would not have been possible for me to undertake my research. The same applies to all of you in one form or another. You will seek data from people who are volunteering. And these are the people in my view who are the most important in the process of the conduct of your own uh, doctoral work and in subsequent publications that emerge from it. So this first 40 minute session will cover uh, an introduction in general to evidence-based medicine and to systematic reviews and to developing a research question and uh, from it to develop a search strategy. We will pursue that in the second session of, uh, uh, of the webinar today. May, may I just check one more time that uh, I am being heard well? 
if there are any question or comment, you can uh, raise your hand or comment via the chat, uh, just so that we can test that this is working. Might some of you just make a comment? Okay, so I will be here that you hear me well, but thank you very much. So that's an indication that uh, so far it's progressing fine. Thank you. Thank you. I continue to see the comments coming forward in chat. Okay, so with this, I will take the liberty to continue. So evidence-based medicine involves combining what is called the art of clinical practice, uh, which emerges from judgment, experience, and uh, <clears throat> something that is handed down in the culture from senior to junior and from one to another colleague. And this can then be combined with science, uh, which typically is the science which I describe as patient-centered research. I come to describe what this is in a second. Uh, but this type of science is organized in a hierarchy where sometimes of sub, some types of pieces of research have greater value than other types. And we will cover them also throughout this, uh, these three, day, three days of webinars. And when this science is combined with the experience, this is then described as evidence-based medicine. The first step in this evidence-based medicine paradigm is framing the questions, then searching the literature to identify what is relevant to our question, and to use, to appraise what we have identified for its value, and then to use it into practice if what we have found is valuable and trustworthy. If we think about the clinical process where a nurse, a medic, a radiologist, a radiographer, a physiotherapist, any other allied profession, when they come in contact with the clinical problem, they use their knowledge experience and typically knowledge of textbooks and combine it with their experience to make decisions. But evidence-based medicine requires asking a question, acquiring the literature, appraising the literature, typically found, literature that is typically found in published journals, and then combine it with what we know already in order to review whether our decision is correct uh, for the problem we face. As you will see in the coming uh, slides, this systematic review permits us to carry out this process by simply identifying and appraising a single article or a few articles that have systematically reviewed all the literature we need to address our question, and then to use this information to inform practice. Now, before we proceed, let's have a little bit of an overview of um, the different types of literature that can exist. So we can have lab research, and this could evaluate physiological systems, cellular or even subcellular systems. Or we can have research that uh, evaluates patients or groups of people in society. And this could be described as patient-centered research. The idea is that the science moves quickly from testing in laboratory to having an impact in society. And this involves a process called research translation. And this is not a straight line. Here you can move forward, but maybe you have to move a step back before you can move for further forward. 
And this cycle of forward and back continues until we can see it emerging as progress. And there are different levels at which uh, progress is made. And in the first step, one could call it assessment of efficacy, then moving on to effectiveness. And in terms of translation, this transition is called T2 research according to some literature. And the earlier phases are called T0 and T1 where we are moving from lab closer to bedside. And then from T2, where we perform evidence synthesis and, and systematic reviews are a key, key type of evidence synthesis. And this is called T3 research. And then evidence is put into guidelines and then guidelines are implemented. And this is called T4 research or T4 transition. make a health impact. There is a translation phase and this translation phase may involve several steps. If we, if we try to map onto this, the terminology frequently used in uh, pharmacology, then phase one trial, phase two trial, phase three trials map onto clinical efficacy and clinical effectiveness as I show in this slide now. And then phase four you can see is at a much later stage of transition. So between phase three and phase four is the process of systematic reviews, evidence synthesis and guideline making and drug regulation uh, and approval happens before phase three and phase four. I'd like to stop here and give chance for people to ask me and or make any comments about what I have said. And in order to do this verbally, please feel free to unmute your microphone and say anything you want to say. And at the end of that, please do mute your microphone. Please go ahead, anybody who may wish to make any comments or ask any questions. Okay, everybody is quiet. Why? Why is that? Because what is not relatable to what you are doing, or you, you, you or you, you are comfortable with what I've said. Everything is clear so far from uh, uh, I'm happy to continue, uh, but I just want to say that I am a and throughout my uh, to I'm on.
I presume you are able to hear me again. Is that is that all okay? It's okay. Yes. All right. I, so I apologize that we got disconnected. I uh, this is in part because my connection is not necessarily the best, but I believe uh, it will continue to be okay. Uh, if there was any, if there is any interruption, it will be short. We return to my slide. We examined this process of translation. Uh, we, we realize how the terminology I have used maps against the terminology typically used in drug development and approval. And now we look at what types of studies cover different uh, stages of this transition. So feasibility study, pilot study, early study, or small studies typically represent the clinical efficacy field and the transition from clinical efficacy to effectiveness. Multi-center large trials, typically hundreds of patients Excuse me, we can't, we can't see the presentation. You're not you sharing can't the see the presentation. No. Apologies no. for that. Thank you for reminding me about that. Are you now able to see? Please, could you confirm if the, if the slides yes. are now visible? Yes, we can okay. see it now. Remind you about this outline of the transition that I presented earlier. The smaller studies cover the uh, cover the field of the drug regulatory approval is granted. And then systematic reviews are carried out and grid. And then the interventions are rolled out. And during the rollout of the intervention, phase four studies are carried out so that uh, any, any issues can be identified at that stage. Okay, to think about this, just imagine what happened in the last two years and coronavirus vaccination. So in December, 2019, the coronavirus, in December, 2019, the coronavirus issue commenced. Uh, early pilot feasibility studies concerning the vaccine must have been carried out in the earlier months of 2020. During the later months of 2020, the large multi-center trials of coronavirus vaccination were carried out. And at the beginning of this year, regulatory approvals were granted and the vaccination was rolled out. To my knowledge, systematic have not been necessary or required in a published form so far for vaccination, but literature review regulatory authorities in a form that we are going to review in my three seminars. 
this review literature would have been used to make guidelines and give approvals. And following the rollout of the coronavirus vaccine, during the vaccination process, phase four studies would have been carried out. So I hope that looking at this example of coronavirus allows you to imagine this process of translation, the various type of studies, uh, the role of the multi-center, the large multi-center studies, and the systematic review where it fits in. At this stage, I'm going to make a little break again so that in case you have any questions, you can raise your questions. Did anybody want to say anything? Okay, uh, if not, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Um, what about systematic reviews that are actually based on preclinical studies? Okay. Where would what? we place those? Okay. Well, this is fantastic question because it automatically leads to the next slide that I'm about to present. Uh, just look at this translation diagram that I presented earlier. As we undertake early studies, and let's say the basic studies are those early in a systematic way. Form our new early studies. And this process then allows us to firm up the early evidence, make it stronger. And this cycle of reviewing, going back to do new studies and doing new reviews continues until we are able to perform the definitive systematic reviews that allows us to get the regulatory approvals and the guidelines made. I, I hope that makes sense. clinical outcome of the patient. The etiologic research addresses the initial part of this flow diagram, then diagnostic research, then prognostic and therapy research. And all of this can be carried out as primary study by collecting data directly from patients or by collecting data from published studies, which are put together into systematic reviews. So this in a nutshell is the process of framing questions. It has
examine a patient is going to go for surgery and you're going to offer them various options for their treatment, you may offer them the existing treatment or you may offer them a new alternative in your research. So the existing treatment could be the standard therapy. The new treatment could be the new exposure or the intervention. And the participants are the people who have this type of problem, leading them to be admitted to hospital. And after giving them either new treatment or standard therapy, if you follow them up to study their outcome, then this element, these four elements, describe a structure that you can use you frame to frame your research question. And the study design can be a cohort study or a randomized control trial. So using this example, I turn now to a specific question. This question is, can coronavirus cause a lymphoproliferative disorder? A simple question. In this question, the participants are the people at risk of having coronavirus. The exposure is those who have coronavirus tested positive by PCR or other test. And the control condition is those without the coronavirus tested negative on coronavirus. And then we follow the people up to see whether they have the disorder or they don't have the disorder. For example, by obtaining a blood test or a tissue biopsy. And the type of study design, which we are going to discuss in more detail in the next 40 minutes after the break could be a cohort or case control design. So taking this as an example, is any one of you able to frame the question you are studying in your own work? In the remaining five minutes, I'd be grateful for at least one or two example questions put forward. And then during the break, each one of you will have about 10 minutes to think about what you are addressing in your thesis. And when we return, you will present your question to this webinar for us to uh, learn about the question framing process. So I would be grateful if uh, any colleague would come forward with their example question. Uh, earlier, uh, Costa came forward and made a comment in the chat. Uh, feel free to make your comment in the chat or even unmute your microphone and uh, say uh, something about your question. And look, if it's not clear to you, just frame your question in general and I'll help you frame it in the structure that I've described uh, for us to become clear as we go forward. Hello, do you hear yes, me? Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, Thank I'm, you for uh, coming forward. I am Hoika, I'm a dentist. And my question regarding my research would be, does a specific fluoride varnish help with um, post-radiation caries? Okay, so who are the participants? 
Uh, in general, the participants are those who have had radiotherapy of the head and neck region because of the head and neck cancer diagnosis. Okay, so people who will be exposed to radi radiation as part of their treatment. So these yes. are the participants. Yes. Then exposure and control. Normally, there are two groups. Normally, um, I would choose the exposure would be the one of, well, all are basically the, the patients with head and neck cancer who have undergone uh, radiotherapy, but the exposure group would be the ones uh, we are testing the new varnish on that is used in so uh, the new, other populations while- So the new, so the new varnish, is your intervention. Yeah. And the comparison is presumably the, the standard yes. water. Yes. Okay, very good. And then what is the outcome? The outcome is caries. Uh, the outcome is either prevention of caries or yes. um, slowing of the progression of it. And how is caries measured? Um, well, there is a couple of indexes uh, regarding the depth or the activity of the lesion. Hello? Thank um, you for coming forward and for putting forward a, your question as an example for all other colleagues. Thank you. Uh, uh, so what I would like is we are going to take a break in just a moment, but when I return after 10 minutes, it would be fantastic if a few more colleagues would present their question in exactly the same way, uh, covering your participants and the new intervention or exposure and the standard and the outcome. And once we have covered these, we will then move on to study the issue of study design concerning question. So with this, uh, we'll bring this session to an end. You will receive another email concerning the next session within the next five minutes. And then we will see you in 10 minutes. Thank you.